Now for our second keynote speaker, we are fortunate to have Dr. Bob Scholes. Bob is a systems ecologist who works at the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research here in South Africa. And he's one of those people who has successfully bridged the science policy gap. He's an expert on savanna and woodland ecology, but he's also a convening lead author of the IPCC and chair of the group on Earth Observation Biodiversity Observation Network, the so-called GeoBon, along with many other leadership roles. Last Thursday, Bob helped us synthesize the results of a day-long symposium on developing a new research agenda for the dry forests of Africa. And he's promised to import some of the insights from that event into his remarks today. Dr. Scholes. Minister, representatives of the many organizations who are part of this, uh, this Forest Day, uh, participants and, and, and delegates. One of my favorite characters from, uh, from literature is uh, Dr. Zeus's Lorax, who says, I am the Lorax, I speak for the trees. Well, I am the species Lorax africanus. I am going to speak to you on behalf of African trees today. So the main things that I'm going to tell you today is I'm first going to try and build for you a scientific case for why it is that forests matter as much as they do. And in particular, I'm going to paint for you why African forests, and particularly African dry forests, are an increasingly important part of that equation. And then I'll talk a little bit about some of the issues that African dry uh, forests and African forests face and what some of the solutions might be uh, for those problems. You know, uh, people speaking in, in, in the plenary sessions of, uh, of Forest Day are not allowed to use PowerPoint presentations and that's a bit of a limitation but I managed to negotiate that I will be allowed to show you one slide because what I'm going to tell you uh, need, needs that assistance. And the key point is this, is that human activities are putting approximately nine petagrams of carbon per year into the uh, emitting from, from, from the land surface. Now a petagram is a number that most of us just can't get our heads around. When I explain it to my mother, I say a petagram is a kilometer by a kilometer by a kilometer of solid carbon. Just think of a big black box full of you know, solid graphite or diamonds, if you like, uh, a kilometer by a kilometer. That's one petagram. We're putting nine of those off the surface of the earth through our activities every year. Now, the trick is this, is that only half of that, 47%, in fact, in 2010, appears in the atmosphere. Where does the rest go? Well, the rest is taken up by the ecosystems of the world. And it so happens that it's taken up almost equally between the oceans and the land. And it's that take uptake on the land where forests play an absolutely critical role. So if you did the sums while I was talking, that 25%, in other words, that half of one half that goes into the land is that 2.4 petagrams uh, per year going into what we refer to as the overall land sink. Now, what makes up that land sink? It has two large components. The one is what's disappearing into forests, and the other is what's disappearing into non-forests. So I would pause there for a moment just to give us a reminder. We use forests as the poster child for the land sink, you know, the, uh, the lungs of the world and, and, and all that stuff. And that's true, but remember that about the same amount is going into less charismatic ecosystems, into grasslands, into wetlands, into rangelands, and into agriculture as well. All right, so we have these two large components. If we further unpack the, uh, the forest side of this equation, moving on, 
What we can see is that forests sink, so there's a net uptake from the atmosphere into the land surface in forests, actually composes of a big uptake in intact forests and then a net emission uh, from the forests that are being transformed. And that forest transformation is in fact a, a, a consequence of two things going up, going on. One is the deforestation flux, which is that large number of 2.94 petagrams, which is balanced, in fact, by a regrowth on many of those deforested areas which are subsequently abandoned and, re, and, and regrowed. So it's a complicated picture, but the important thing is, is that we're aiming at that 2.94, and that's a huge number. Remember, that all of the efforts which thus far have gone into the Kyoto Protocol really only address 50% of the world's uh, emitters, and of those, they have managed to achieve about a 5% you know, deviation from, fr from the baseline. So, in other words, all of the efforts of all the other parts of the world add up to about 2.5% of the emissions. That there, is nearly a quarter of the mission. So if we can do something to influence that, we can have a greater effect than everything that has happened so far under the Kyoto Protocol. And that's why this is so important. The other thing to remember is not only are we going after that number there, that big number there, but we really have to make sure that this number here is not compromised. The things that the forests are doing, the intact forests are doing, all by themselves, we need to ensure that they're able to continue doing. I also need to caution everyone against the oversimplification which we all commit. I'm very fond of that statement by Albert Einstein that everything should be as simple as possible and in this complex realm of red and negotiations that's absolutely true. But he then goes on to caution, but no simpler. And we use carbon as a shorthand for everything to do with climate. And of course, that's not true. First of all, when we're assessing carbon in these kind of situations, we need to make sure that we're counting all of the carbon, not just the carbon that happens to suit us or the carbon that happens to be easy to measure. In many of, for instance, the African dry forests, most of the carbon is below ground. And if we carefully measure all the trunks of the trees and add them up, uh, that's only a fraction of the carbon. The real carbon is sitting elsewhere in the system. Secondly, we can't just look at the carbon and ignore the other greenhouse gases. We have to do full greenhouse gas uh, uh, accounting. A classic example comes in with, for instance, uh, forested wetlands. Now, forested wetlands are a store of carbon, but they're a source of methane. And unless you count the methane as well as the carbon dioxide, you can get the sums horribly wrong. You can be taking up more carbon, but actually having a negative effect on the atmosphere. So we have to look at all the greenhouse gases. Depending on the situation, that can include nitrous oxide. It can also include the uh, ozone precursors, very important here in Africa, and the aerosols that are produced uh, from forested landscapes as well. But beyond that, there are circumstances where we also have to consider the direct forcing that forested landscapes have on the climate. We know the case of, for instance, when you put dark forested canopies over a snow-covered landscape. We know, in fact, that doesn't help out the climate at all. In fact, it is negative in terms of the climate. Now, there are situations, in fact, around the world where the same thing happens with needn't involve snow and conifers. So sometimes we have to do corrections for the direct effects that we have on the climate by putting uh, 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 more trees into the landscape. And finally, we need to look at full project cycles and the footprint of our actions wherever they occur, not just within the narrow area that we're looking at involved in the project, but where is that displaced activity going and, and what is the emissions that result in totality uh, from this action that we are taking. We can uh, take this slide off now. I'm done with that. Thank you very much. We also need to subtly change the mental models that we have on what deforestation consists of, especially when we look at Africa. We are all familiar 
with the deforestation in tropical areas that has occurred in Southeast Asia, and we have images of smoldering uh, peat, tropical peatlands and conversion into, uh, into oil palm plantations. We also have images from the Amazon of tall uh, rainforests being pushed over by bulldozers to make way for pastures or for, for log extraction. And those phenomena are real and true. But they represent waves of deforestation which are now actually coming into their kind of point of maturity and starting to slow down partly because the resources have been exhausted, but partly because new policies have been put in place uh, to, to, to address them. The next major wave of deforestation is already happening and it's happening in Africa. And it's not happening through those mechanisms. In fact, the first, the initial stages of deforestation everywhere in the world, in Southeast Asia and in uh, tropical America, did not take place in the tall, moist rainforests at all. It takes place in the dry forests which are adjacent uh, to the, 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 the moist forest. Not the forest fringe, but the very large, extensive areas under Diptera carp forests in Southeast Asia or under Cerrados, for instance, in South America. And those are the areas which get transformed to a, uh, to a much greater extent and much earlier on in the process than the tall, moist forests. Now, they only have, in rough terms, about half the carbon per hectare as tall, moist forests do, but they are twice as extensive. And so, in fact, the big emissions and the big transformations take place initially in that environment. And there's good reasons for this. You know, moist tropical rainforests, we all love them from the comfort of our, uh, of our couches watching National Geographic and Discovery Channel, but they're actually rather nasty places to live in. And very few people do live in them because their access is terrible, they're full of biting insects, they're unhealthy, and it's really quite hard to grow a crop there. There are certain crops that will survive there, but many of this, you know, the crops that, 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 that we uh, depend on actually prefer to grow in those dry forest environments ar around the edges. And those areas are the ones that transform because you can get in there. You can build a road, uh, you can clear them, you can live there relatively healthily if you take the right precautions. The soils are not great, but they can be made very productive. Uh, and so that's, in fact, where the focus is. Secondly, we, we need to understand that certainly in the areas in which I have experience, which is uh, e East and Southern Africa, the actual pattern of forest land transformation is not this classical mental image of here was a tall intact forest, along come people and they cut it down and they turn it into a non-forest. And you can detect that from space using a satellite and it's very clear it was a forest and now it's not a forest and we can you know, work out the, the, the numbers. The typical pattern in the African uh, dry forests and woodlands is first of all, you get high grading. You get the valuable timbers being extracted. And that's a process which has actually been occurring for about a century. And the really high value timbers, for instance, African blackwood, is now extremely rare. It has been selectively removed over a long period of time. The next thing that happens is that you get the charcoal manufacturers uh, coming into those areas. Now that's been driven by the African pattern of, uh, of urbanization, so large populations living in urban areas who need domestic energy, and charcoal is a much easily, more easily transportable form of energy for those populations who often don't have access to other energy sources. And so that drives then the removal of a large proportion of the remaining trees, and then finally you get uh, uh, agriculturalists coming in, low input, low output agriculture, which after a few cycles leaves us with an extremely degraded, shrubby situation, which is of very little value uh, for any of those services. I would argue, however, that it is both unfeasible and in fact undesirable to prevent land cover change in Africa. Africa's population, currently a billion, will double over the next 40 years. There will be two billion people. And those people have a right to come to a standard of living which is much higher than their present standard of living. And it's not for us to say that they may not do this in order that Africa might be some you know, giant uh, national park for the world. We can, however, leapfrog 
the pattern that we've seen elsewhere in the world of going into a degraded landscape and then having to spend a huge amount of effort to then restore that into some kind of functional landscape. What we can do, because of the situation in Africa, largely many of these areas are functionally intact. They are still working as functioning uh, ecosystems which can support a wide range of services. We can transform those landscapes in an intelligent way towards a situation where they can deliver more of everything that we require of them and maintain minimum levels of those critical things that we have to have out of them. Yesterday was uh, one of the releases of the uh, uh, Global Panel on Food Security and Climate Change. And amongst its seven recommendations was one which related to what we're referring to as sustainable intensification. And that is one of the key things that we need to do. There is no choice for us but to transform some of this landscape into agriculture, but we need to do it in such a way that we're getting the most out of those areas that we do transform and sparing other parts of this landscape to deliver the services that they deliver. We need to do this in a climate smart way. <clears throat> what we need to achieve that kind of transformation is several things. Firstly, we need to ensure that there is a fair price for the services that those landscapes provide. And that means not only ensuring that the amount of money that's committed to this is adequate to the task, but to also avoid what I refer to as economic leakage. Now, in this area of carbon services, we're all familiar with the notion of leakage, which is that you, you know, preserve your carbon here, but it leaks out of the landscape somewhere else because the people doing their activities here have simply shifted to over there. Well, there's another form of leakage as well, and that is that it, when we put aside $100 billion you know, for a purpose uh, s such as red, in fact, very large fractions of that get creamed off by the machinery that we put in place to make sure that this happens. So it goes to a huge international bureaucracy, it goes taken off by a whole bunch of consultants, it gets taken off by the people who assess the carbon credits and the brokerage, and finally, right at the end of the tailpipe, the people who are actually doing, taking the opportunity cost of not transforming that landscape get a pittance out of it. So we need to make that whole flow much more efficient than it is. We need to avoid it being captured by a whole series of elites along the, uh, 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 along the pipeline. <laughs> Secondly, we need to have effective, informed, and just governance of the system at all levels, from the international level, through the national level, and down to the local level. Without this, we will not achieve what we need to achieve. And finally, we need reliable and cost-effective ways of measuring our achievements and ensuring that we are satisfying them. And this will require a fusion of very high technology approaches such as satellites, such as airborne LIDARs, such as ground-based LIDAR uh, scanners, but also with much lower technology interventions as well. Community involvement in measuring the resources that they have themselves. Uh, very straightforward things, not rocket science at all, but it needs to be integrated with these other techniques so that we can have robust and transparent and credible and cost-effective systems for achieving this. The guidance on this no, needs not to be some standard of absolute accuracy that we get within so many percent of the true mean. The guidance of this is in fact a utilitarian concept. We need sufficient accuracy. We need enough accuracy to know that both the buyers and the sellers are satisfied that at least this amount of the service is being provided. We don't need to apply those extremely um, demanding technical scientific standards of getting it down to an absolute precise measure, we need to be able to have a level of measurement which gives comfort to all uh, the, the, the parties. So in summary, forests matter a lot. They matter an enormous amount. And what we can do to protect the integrity of that carbon sink and to restore it and to stop 
the source term from, you know, to reduce the source term can make a bigger difference to the future of the climate at this juncture of the world's history than anything that we've done up to now. This is a cause worth putting a lot of effort into. Let's not kid ourselves uh, about the technical and institutional challenges that we have to rise to to ensure that it happens in a way that is effective, but it is a challenge that's worth putting that effort into. Thank you.